Well, there are a gazillion messages out there from self-help gurus, talk show hosts, motivational thinkers, and holistic doctors, all promoting the message that positive thinking can have a transformational effect on any number of personal problems. And that's a message that my next guest profoundly disagrees with. David Rakoff is a regular contributor to the New York Times Magazine, GQ, and Public Radio International's This American Life. He lives in New York City, but he was, of course, deeply and forever affected by his Canadian upbringing right here in Toronto. In his latest collection of scathingly insightful personal essays, he takes on positive thinking and other social ills. It's called Half Empty, and its cover reassures that no inspirational life lessons will be found in these pages. It's out now on bookstore shelves, and David Rakoff joins me live in Studio Q. Hello. Hello, sir. Hi, thanks for having me. Your official introduction. Very nice to meet you. I, uh, I've quite enjoyed this book, and I've been looking forward to having you, you here. Your opening essay talks about the hopeful expectations you had of a book called The Positive Power of Negative Thinking by jo- Julie Norum. What was it about that concept that got you so excited? Well, Julie Norum's book was uh, about to hit bookshelves about nine years ago, almost exactly nine years ago. And the New York Times Magazine sent me down to Wellesley, Mass., where she's a tenured professor of psychology. And her book was about a very specific kind of pessimism called defensive pessimism, um, which is different from the pessimism we think of, which is where you wake up in the morning, you think this is going to be a disaster, and you go back to bed. That That's actually an illness, and everybody will tell you that that's an illness, and they'll, they'll be right. It's not that. Um, hers was a kind of defensive pessimism, which is where you shake off the covers and you say, this will be a disaster. And then you go that next step and you say, well, why will it be a disaster? And you interrogate yourself. And in so doing, you deconstruct the disaster that's looming and you come up with plans for how to stave it off. Inoculate yourself. Exactly. You know, you're going on this radio show. It's going to be a disaster. (laughs) Well, in what ways is it going to be a disaster? So you make sure to go to the bathroom first. You make sure to have something to say. You make sure to have a mint. I don't know. Whatever these things that loom in your event horizon that that freak you out. Um, And it seemed uh, to be an exciting book to me because what she was essentially saying was whether you're positive, a positive thinker or a negative thinker, these things are about as neutral as having brown eyes. Mm. It's just your cognitive style. And that there needs to be... But in order to say something as innocuous as that, there did need to be a wholesale cultural shift to allow people who were perhaps not super rosy and optimistic at, to the table. But w- wait a second. Let me, let me t- sorry to cut you off, but I'm, there's so much you're saying that I want to pick up on. So I want to come back to defensive uh, pessimism. But first of all, just because you have to answer this, uh, there, I mean, there's so many people who do uh, earnestly buy into the, 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 the power of positive thinking. Why, why, do you, why does that bother you? It bothers me because it doesn't necessarily work. Um, And when I say necessarily, uh, you could just leave a blank. Uh, It (laughs) It doesn't work, is what you're saying. It doesn't really work. Right. It can calm you down. It can uh, have an effect of some nice uh, corporeal feelings where you're not your heart rate isn't going a mile a minute, and that's absolutely fine. But it doesn't necessarily work. What it does is positive thinking broadens your thinking. It's a it's a bigger picture, rosy way of looking at things. Mm. Negative thinking is uh, more detail-oriented, and it's contingency-based. So positive thinking can work for you, but only to a certain point. If you really have to get down to the nitty-gritty details of how something is going to work and move forward, you actually do need contingency thinking, which is another way of talking about negative thinking, because you're thinking about negative outcomes. So there's that. It doesn't work. Um, you are not, you, you're not what you think. You're not, you, 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 you know, when people say, if you believe it's going to, if you believe you're going to have a good day, you will will that to happen. Would that that were true, but then the converse is true as well, which is that all those kids making our sneakers in Malaysia are either <clears throat> making them because they really want to, mm. uh, or their positive thinking is not positive enough. So it's their fault. It's essentially, I don't know what the CRTC rules are here, (laughs) what I'm allowed to say. What were you about to say? Shall I just say it and then you can can beep it out or anything? Now you're putting me on the spot. It's it's crap. It's it's crap is what I was going to say. It doesn't work. And it, in fact, blames the victim. It, It 
it blames you the outcome of your life upon your attitude. And it's simply not true. Mm. In fact, study after study has shown, in fact, that people, uh, dizzy, people with disease, those who have um, a positive attitude towards their disease, die in numbers no fewer than those with a uh, yeah, I want to get to that because that's so, interesting too. I mean, it's incredibly telling. You you say that this sunny disposition, this this latest spate of positive thinking, started around the year two thousand. No, no, no. Around the year two thousand, I think that it was getting it was really having extreme damage. No, it started around post war apparently with Dale Carnegie and the positive. Why was it having damage around the year two thousand? Well, around the year two thousand, it was simply the narrative was no longer adding up, at least insofar as I could tell. I don't have a head for numbers, but I did understand the fact that there was money flowing with supreme abandon. There were all these dot-coms beginning, and they were all based on a story. And I understand stories. I don't understand money, but I do understand stories. And none of the stories were adding up. So I was being presented at various parties and things like this with the story as to the reason I was eating it, sort of a beggar's purse with creme fraiche and caviar. And the reason was because we set up a business model whereby people can actify their, you know, all these neologisms and things that didn't seem entirely true to my mind. And I felt like the kid with the emperor's new clothes, uh, trying to point out that there was a lot of nakedness around, but in fact it wasn't working. The money really was flowing like water. Everybody but me was getting rich. And I still, was not comfortable with that. It didn't seem right. And it seemed based in a kind of groundless optimism that people were wishing to make it so and that there were people with deep pockets who were making it so, but it didn't seem to have staying power. And, and you were right. Well, that's by coincidence because I really don't have a capacity for... You're not a prophet. Whew. I, what's the opposite of a prophet? I, you know, I, what there can are you few, say on the CRTC? What, what, what are you allowed to say? I'm the, uh, literally, I have my finger off the pulse. I mean, I can, I can give you <laughs> chapter and verse of examples. In 1986, you know, I, I got a job uh, in, a, in an office. I had been an East Asian Studies major, so I went to Tokyo like we all did. And in 1986, I got a job in an office where they said, well, we're setting up a virtual, no, no not virtual. We're setting up a newsletter on the computer. The word virtual didn't exist. And I said, well, where's the newsletter? And they were like, on the computer. I said, that's interesting, so it doesn't really exist. And they were really mad because the word virtual didn't exist it didn't, at that point. But I had basically said, you don't exist. And they were like, what do you mean? Uh, and then, so that was just embarrassing. And then they said, and people will go on to the computer and they'll talk to each other all day long. And I thought, all day long? <laughs> What is, what's wrong with you people? Right. So I quit within 12 hours. Right. Right. So 1980, you, 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 you missed the internet. You didn't believe I missed the, the internet yeah, yeah. and left as if I'd had my reservations <laughs> on the Titanic canceled. I was like, bye, losers. So, okay, right, right, flash right. forward 80, 86. Oh, flash backward, 82. Oh. New York City, Danceteria. In a vain attempt to sort of inhabit my body. You know, I was in my first year of college. Um, I went downtown to a club to Danceteria. And, you know, the line for the bathroom was so long and I had to pee and I was like, oh, I have to check my coat. And it's like, I have a class in the morning. I'm, I'm just not very, I don't have a very uh, unmediated relationship okay. to fun. So I wasn't having a good time. Right, right. And then the evening's entertainment came on and it was this really whiny chick who like danced up on a stage no bigger than this table. Right, I know. And she bounced around. She was wearing rubber gasket bracelets. And I thought... Okay, is it just me or she just she's lousy? She's horrible. She's terrible. Yeah, it's not working. D terrible. And you she suck. Ends, and she ends up being Madonna. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Then I the go, opposite I go, of the prophet. I'm, I'm, so the opposite of the prophet. So, 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 in broad strokes, why is negative thinking uh, a positive thing to engage in? Negative thinking is a positive thing to engage in because it clarifies thought, because it makes one focus on detail and contingency. And because when you're at least thinking partially negatively, things tend to go wrong less. <laughs> In an anarchic, amoral universe that does not care one jot for you or me, or another way of saying is the world is not your mother, so nobody owes you anything, and circumstance does not owe you a positive outcome, it is always better to be thinking what could possibly go wrong. It just simply is. But uh, where's the line between negative thinking and just being an ornery... A downer? Downer, yeah. 
there is a line. And it's a line that needs uh, help on both sides. If you're a negative thinker, you have to try to keep your anxious mental rehearsal to yourself. Mm. And it's a, it's a lesson that I have to learn every morning of my life. I'm better now. I do know how to hold my tongue. What does that mean, what you just said? Keeping your anxious mental rehearsal to yes. yourself? Don't be the guy in the party who says, hey, where, where's the fire exit? Does everybody have to breathe so much? Because I think there's, I don't know, I'm not a, an expert, but I think there might be a limited amount of oxygen. So why don't we right. breathe shallowly? Keep I mean, that to yourself. Keep that to yeah, yourself. Yeah. Don't be that guy, as I right. have been so many times in my life. <laughs> right. Inside voice. Inside yeah, voice. Okay. In, exa- truly inside yeah. voice. On the other side, don't necessarily tar those people with the brush of being complete killjoys or unpatriotic or, you know, that that's just them in the way that that's just you. So give me an example of how you have used defensive pes- pessimism. I literally use it in every aspect of my life. Everything, because I'm an anxious guy, because everything I do is sort of freighted with anxiety, um, all I do is this kind of deeply self-conscious thinking about what is to come. Uh this morning, I knew that, you know, I'm flying back home today, so I knew that I had to get a wake-up call, but I knew that the wake-up call might not work, so I had to sit down with my cell phone, and I'm not technically facile, and sort of learn how to do the alarm thing, and that took a while, and then I... That's just being practical. Precisely. I see. But it's the same thing. But the, I see. The pessimism is, what if the wake-up call doesn't get come? I better fix this. Precisely. But but it, it sounds like you're you're sort of waving a... a, a you're, you're saying that all people who engage in positive thinking are, are impractical. Are you saying that somebody who believes in the power of positive thinking would just be sitting there going, the wake-up call will come. I don't need to plan for anything. There are such people. There are strategic optimists who are such people. Um, but generally, they tend to have wives, you know, who pick, who wake them up. <laughs> Can I just, as an aside, I want to, like, there, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but but you, you you spend some time in this book with a particular objection to Rent, the, mu- the, the musical. Yes. Why, why do you hate Rent so much? I hate Rent so much for a variety of reasons. One yeah. is it's fairly tuneful, you know, and the songs are fairly accessible, yeah. and I will absolutely absolutely stipulate to the charge that it is about my life in New York at a very specific time. Right. So I'm not above being moved emotionally by the things that I remember of my life in the 80s in New York City, which were a very grim and black time, and I lost many, many friends. You know, So Rent is definitely a button that can push for me. The thing that I hate so much about Rent is that it is meant to be this great celebration of La Vie Bohème. You know, a life spent as artists, as Bohemian devil artists, may care. Yeah, sure, exactly. Yeah. No one makes any art. <laughs> Literally, no one makes any art. So rent seems to me symptomatic of what has happened now in terms of, uh, in terms of reality television, for example. Right. Is it the primacy of work? What used to make an artist or a creative person was the work. And the work that they did, they did in silence, tolerating themselves through these really unattractive phases of silence and solitude where you have to grind out a piece of work and then you have to make it better and then you have to make it better and then you have to make it better and only upon doing so when you've amassed a body of work and you've done your work can you go to the cafe and quaff freely of the right. raffia <laughs> bottle wrapped you know Chianti right. Right. and cavort with the nude models right. in your sun washed you, 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 garret you want to see them doing the work or in, at least in the acknowledge musical. doing some work <laughs> well, but they have such contempt for people who do work <laughs> That's the thing. One person does work in the whole musical, and they're like, what a bitch? Careerist bitch? And, you know, literally no what? one does any work. But we're supposed to assume that they're doing work. Why? Because they're telling the story outside but of, even well, we have to watch them paint. He's but- not painting. That's the thing. He's literally, like, on his guitar. Dear, 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 dear. Oh, that's, I've done enough of that. And the other one goes to a demo and, like, shoots demo footage, and there's suddenly the new Scorsese, and it's like, No, he hasn't expressed an interest in a film that exists. He hasn't (laughs) in any way evidenced an artist's eye. He's complained about his parents, and he doesn't want to pay his rent. I was that guy. I was that bitter guy who wanted a creative life in New York City, and I had a lousy, 
day job, and I worked at it for decades. And I got robbed, and I didn't do my work creatively because I was scared of it being bad. And believe me, it was bad, but guess what I did? I paid rent. So... David, I have a minute and a half left with you, and I know oh, I know sorry. you know what that means because you do so much radio. I'm sorry. I, I, I want to come back to what you come back to in the book, which is the negative thinking and and or or at least the, the fallacy of the power of positive thinking in your view. And you, the last chapter of your book is quite moving. You, you're very candid about your own health issues that you've had, and a group that particularly. Uh, who are encouraged to think positively uh, are those facing illness. And you write that, and I'm quoting you, a sense of humor and strength to wear sky high Jimmy Choo's to chemo is a fine stance if it works for you, but its inverse seems to constitute a failure of character. Tell me about your experience with being the, the positive thinking being imposed upon you when you, you don't really feel positive. Well, luckily enough, it was never imposed upon me. I, The people that I came into contact with already had a fair sense of how I might respond to such a thing. So I really didn't experience a great deal of positive thinking being foisted upon me. And it turns out that, in fact, when you are facing um, your own potential shuffling off of this mortal coil, one does tend to be fairly optimistic about one's prospects of continuing to live. But that said... Um, yeah, there was all that crazy, sexy cancer, you know, I'm going to wear, you know, I'm going to be sex in the city on the cancer ward. And it's like, well, I'm not. So does that therefore mean that I deserve to die? Mm. That's kind of essentially what they're saying. It is a kind of victim blaming stance to take. It's great if it works for you that you want to dress like a $3,000 clad tart <laughs> to your chemo. But this person doesn't feel that right now. And we've got to believe in that the science itself is going to work for them as well. It's really great to have you here. Thank you Do so much come for back, having me. Will you? I will. David Rakoff, his book of essays is called Half Empty. It's published by Doubleday Canada, and he's been with me here in Studio Q.